Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us here today as we learn about wiping out waste while designing new buildings. I am Christina Handel, an architect, professor of architecture, and I lead the dissemination of research here at the Healthy Materials Lab. Before we get started, I want to introduce the lab for those of you who might be new to us. Healthy Materials Lab is a design-led research lab at Parsons School of Design at the New School in New York City. We are dedicated to placing people's health at the center of all design decisions. What this means in practice is that we raise awareness about toxics in our built environment, and we are working to make healthier alternatives more accessible and more popular. We do this work with explicit focus on those designing, building, and living in affordable housing because all people deserve healthier interior environments. So this is our last event of the semester, and we are so glad you could be here live today. If you weren't able to attend our other events, don't worry. We're able to post most of them on our YouTube page, including this semester's amazing Mycelium Millennium Talks, Harvesting Housing with Red House Studio, and our spring keynote with the incredible Dr. Shana Swan. Links will be posted now in the chat. So this event, as you all know, since you've joined us, is particular to this week. We're pleased to participate in Circular City Week, which is an open collaborative festival for circular economy related events. And it just so happens to be the world's largest circular economy festival. Wipeout Waste is supported by the Norwegian Consulate of New York, and we want to thank them for introducing us to our guest and her impressive project. All right, so let's begin into why we're all here today, circularity in building. In the architecture studios that I teach, we are confronted with questions about circularity all the time. And the term may come disguised in different words, in different kinds of discussions. We talk about reuse, we talk about redesign, renovation, recycling, repurposing, and so forth. For instance, on sites with abandoned buildings, it's quite easy to call for a demolition and to build from scratch with new materials. Yet students show a restless and unconstrained desire to propose projects that repurpose former spaces for new programs, that celebrate a history of what used to be, or that reuse materials from the demolition. We dream of that potential too, but we honestly don't have too many real examples to draw from. We acknowledge the opportunities and the responsibilities that we have in the design and architecture fields to prioritize circularity alongside, obviously with healthy material specifications for human health and the health of the planet. So we are grateful today to have Ocel to illuminate us with this impressive example where materials from old buildings brought life to a new one. Circularity can promise a path to radically reducing carbon emissions and therefore slowing the changing climate, but only if we do it much more. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome Osil to our virtual stage. For those who don't know me, I'm also with the Healthy Materials Lab. I'm um, co-founder and design director at the lab. My name is John Sara Ruth. And we've been speaking with Osil for um, several weeks, maybe even over a month, um, about her incredible project. And we're really thrilled to be able to um, have her come to our stage here today. And like Christina said, during Circular City Week, it makes so much sense. So um, Osil Vangestein Berivek is an architect, partner, and CEO at MAD Oslo in Norway. She has 19 years of experience under her belt as an architect and has been the team leader on several large scale urban projects, including the MAD building in Oslo, the Media City Bergen, as well as this cutting edge reuse project, Christian August Gate 13, that we'll hear about today. As CEO, Osil is passionate about nurturing high performance teams who are highly collaborative. She was educated in Norway and in France. MAD architects believe that good architecture and design must be founded on knowledge about a local community's need and local context, always designing on behalf of the city. They're constantly seeking answers about how to better meet climate and social challenges through architecture, design, and knowledge of urban and local developments. MAD architects are known in Norway as leaders in sustainable architecture and design, particularly around this topic, of reusing materials. Their ultimate goal is to inspire more reuse and reuse architecture around the globe. 
So I'm very pleased to present Osil today. Just before she begins, I'd like to just um, state a little bit of housekeeping, which is I'm sure there will be questions that come up while she's speaking. Please use the Q&A function at below rather than the chat for all of your questions. So it just says Q&A and there's a little thought bubble above it. So you could use that function to add in questions during the talk. And then if you see other questions that you like, you can upvote them with a little like symbol there. Um, and that way we'll, we'll have all the questions kind of collated at the end of, at, at the, end of the presentation. So from here, Osil, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really happy to, to join you and to, to show you some of my uh, our work. <laughs> okay, so I'll just share my screen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Dear all, uh, as John Sara said, I'm Osil van Stenbjørvik. I work at MAD Architecture in Oslo, and I'm going to talk about circular economy and reuse today. Ah, uh, yeah, this is me. <laughs> so who's MAD? Uh, we are a Norwegian interdisciplinary architectural office working in several fields. We are approximately 100 people. Mad Architecture works with architecture and urbanism, interiors. Uh, we have a communication agency. We have landscape architects and neighborhood planning. And the most recent adventure is by Mad. That's our own bar and cafe in downtown Oslo. So next time you're in Oslo, uh, please come and visit. Uh, and we work here with a broad range of projects in all scales, from urbanism, new buildings, and mostly with rehabilitation, transformation, and reuse. We are all about our people, and they are essential to the outputs of, of um, our projects. Our end goal is always to contribute, contribute to a better society. Okay, this is just a quick intro with some of the challenges that we see in today's building industry. We all know this. But what we also have to face is that, is that uh, for many of these goals, the building industry has a great impact and we have great responsibility. You all know this. Over the last decades, the building industry has changed radically. To make more um, sustainable buildings, but the focus has very often been on energy and technology. And we demolish buildings to replace them with new ones, more if energy efficient or with better technology, which is, uh, yeah. <laughs> we continue down the same path as earlier. We extract huge amounts of materials and produce technical installations, square meters, CO2, and large amounts of um, amounts of waste. Um, when we constructed buildings uh, like a century ago, we might have needed around 50 material components like wood, brick, steel, glass, concrete, etc. Buildings today require an extreme amount of material components, and we can choose from millions of components. <laughs> this is an installation by Rem Koolhaas. This is from the Venice Biennale in 2014. And I think this image says more than a thousand words in so many ways, in the old fashioned way to build, about how we build machines and, and about daylight, about flexibility. It's, it's, um, uh, <laughs> the amount of components in use is one of the reasons for the great amounts of waste in the building industry. These are examples of um, outer walls. The linear economy gives us materials that come with assembly instructions and the guarantee. And the craftsmen were replaced by installers. Okay, so I'll tell you a bit about the project uh, that's, that uh, tries to break this tradition or this uh, this is a bad way of building. 
we designed this building for a um, uh, developer called Entram. That's one of the biggest private uh, real estate investors in Norway. Um, and they have a high focus on environmental um, sustainability. The project is named uh, KA13. It's located in the city, uh, that's the address actually. It's located in the city center of Oslo. Here it's marked in red. Um, it's a modest office building from the 1950s. It was part of an area marked for new development in Oslo and where several buildings have been demolished over the last decade. And this building was also marked for demolition in the Solomon Plan. On the left, we see the original facade of the building. I think you will all agree that it's rather uh, uninspiring. <laughs> the existing building had several challenges, including quite low, low ceiling heights and a long and narrow site, which can be a challenge for having good daylight quality. We did numbers of studies on how to uh, utilize the site in the best possible way, but we also saw the potential in the building as it was. And once we were inside, we struck gold and we found very nice and high quality interior with a simple and flexible floor plan, which could be great for modern office spaces. And with these discoveries, we decided to pres preserve the building um, structure and simply add a few extensions uh, to increase the project um, capacity. So this is uh, seen from the courtyard. Uh, the existing building in yellow and pink. Um, we built a new eight story extension with reused building components. These were sourced from many different rehabilitation and demolition sites across Norway. Um, and that uh, more uh, playful facade is the extension, um, highlighting the fact that this is somehow not the usual building. The programming remained uh, the same with offices on all floors. Uh, we added some new functions, including a bar and a cafe on the first floor and rooftop terraces, adding value to the project. We had three different material flows in the project. We preserved the existing building with all components and materials within, which we would call local reuse. And we reused materials from other buildings, which were under rehabilitation or set for demolition. And even in a circular project, some things go into the circle. Of course, we can only add healthy materials, <laughs> reuse if possible, new materials if necessary. And we also had some materials going out of the circle, uh, harmful materials handled correctly, and some healthy materials were also sold for reuse. So how does this process work? We've been working with reuse and transformation of buildings for quite some time, and we had useful skills and experiences. However, reusing single building components as done in KA13 is somewhat uh, quite different. This diagram we, we developed before we began with the project in order to convince the market or the, the client that uh, reuse is possible and to help plan the process. After the project, we saw that this was a bit too simple, even a bit uh, naive, I would say. We were prepared to face the challenges and thought the process would be something like this. <laughs> and it ended up being more like this. Um, I won't go through this in detail. It's also in Norwegian, but you see the chain, which is dependent on many different processes and decisions. Um, and you have to apply this to all the components in a modern building. And you see that um, the amount of information is enormous. And the process diagram that we made before the start is more relevant as an overview of new business opportunities in a circular building industry. For example, registering, developing databases, um, demounting, 
buying and selling, logistics, storage, testing and certifying, adjusting, and industrialization of these processes. I think this will go fast. Um, there are great, there's great interest into this, um, this new building industry and a lot of new initiatives, also internationally. Okay, so regarding the architectural concept, in order to maximize daylight, we decided to make an atrium with large vertical openings through all existing floors and the large skylight on top. And behind the paintings, uh, paint and plasterboards, we found a bit of everything, include, including colorful old tiles, which have been taken care of and restored. So there is also a reuse from other buildings. Um, how to find reused building materials? This was one of the first uh, challenges that we faced. And we started this process around four years ago, so it was even less than now. There was no marketplace for buying and selling reused building components in Norway, especially not for large scale components. So we had to crea create our own network. And here you can see the sources for the reused elements. Um, they come from more than 25 different sites uh, in Norway and Oslo mostly. Um, today, the marketplace situation is very different here in Norway, both physical and digital marketplaces are currently under development and expansion. Okay, so this is a diagram to show um, the components that we reused on a typical floor. From ceiling panels to doors, I'll show some of them and some stories behind. The government headquarters in Oslo are currently under redevelopment. There was a terrorist attack in 2011. A number of, building, of buildings being condemned or set for demolition as a part of the new plan. Um, the hollow core slabs in the new extensions are sourced from one of these buildings. There were several challenges when it came to uh, engineering, logistics and cost but it has shown that the reuse of structural elements is possible. And these reused slabs resulted in 89% emission reductions compared to the ones. Approximately 70% of the steel structures are um, reused steel. Um, steel constructions are bolted together rather than welded in order to facilitate deconstruction and further reuse at the end of this building's life cycle. You can see in the middle, there's a, there's a digital model. Um, yeah. And some of the steel is a bit overdimensioned, but that, that was all right. Uh, we reused bricks. Uh, this is a load bearing firewall. And in standard procedure for building this type of wall, you would use concrete. But we decided to make it out of reused steel and brick. It's a quite old fashioned way, um, actually. And it became a functional and a decorative element. We got the windows from another project, which had ordered and received incorrect ones. To the left, you can see our original um, facade sketch and how we had to adjust the design because the different processes didn't coincide. And this exemplifies the difference between a conventional um, or from a conventional design approach. The facade panels were sourced from different buildings and they were trimmed to smaller sizes and mounted um, diagonally on, on the facade in a quite a traditional way. Uh, the metal plates or the metal panels painted uh, on the back side because <laughs> that was easier. Mm, we worked a lot with this, uh, both with the design and uh, on site. And um, actually, we, we found out that we couldn't have, uh, 
the pink ones and the and the beige ones or the brown ones are in our metal uh, panels. And it turned out we couldn't have metal panels uh, towards the corners because they were had to be pleated in a way. So so uh, we were a bit. Uh, we would like to have these pink and brown ones also towards the edges, but we couldn't. So that was a problem. But anyway, uh, I think uh, most people who see this don't really <laughs> don't really see that. Um, yeah. And the bathroom tiles, most of them are surplus materials, tiles from collections that have expired and so on. Um, we got the tiles from a company that were extremely eager to, uh, to help and happy to help. So we got 16 pallets of tiles um, to the site. <laughs> we had to, to resell and or send back uh, most of it. But we did, um, or the interior architects um, did uh, design some collages, uh, kind of, of tiles, and that was done on site because it was the only way to sort it and to uh, to make it work. And also, um, none of the people who were going to to um, work with the tiles on site uh, spoke either Norwegian or English. So this was a case of show and tell and, and try to communicate how we wanted to do this. Um, and the result is kind of refreshing. <laughs> Every one of these rooms are quite unique. Um, I think we would wish that we uh, could have had more colors, more different colors, but it turned out all right. Um, and the further we delved into the detailing and the construction phase, we, the more aware we became that um, we need highly skilled craftsmen to work with this. This amphitheater you see on the right is made of um, wooden handrails that you see on the picture uh, to the left. The original plan was to build this out of timber slabs uh, from a demolished school in Oslo. Uh, but then the demolition was postponed and we had to find something else. So my colleague um, inspecting this old swimming pool uh, building that was supposed to be demolished uh, spotted these handrails and and so the possibility of building this staircase or this amphitheater out of the woods in this um, railings. Um, we often get asked, isn't reuse boring? Isn't it difficult? And I would say it's quite the opposite. It's very exciting to find a new function and use for elements and put them in a new context can be a very creative experience. Um, old steel rating panels were clipped and became a railing. Um, this looks quite easy, but the works, workers were really swearing a lot when they mounted this. This is what I've heard. I, I, I wasn't there. Um, yeah. And as I said, we, we added some new elements too, um, but we have, have to have the criteria that any new elements had to, of course, be made of healthy materials. Um, this is an example, the table flex partition walls, um, which is a circular alternative to traditional plaster walls. Um, to the, we, uh, we, we were the ones who designed this, actually, uh, together with table. Um, normally they make uh, or they produce outer walls, but uh, they, they started making um, the interior walls in this project. Uh, yeah, the rendering of the concept, and then a picture of the actual mounting process in KA13. This is made out of local timber, and to mount it, you need no um, tools. You can be just one person carrying one of these modules. And actually, it's the, it's the material that you see behind me. It's also in our office in, in our place, uh, which we love. Um, so it's flexible and you can take them down and put them up again anywhere. Um, they are uh, designed, as I said, by uh, Made by Mad. This is our product design company. 
and uh, here you can see some photos of of our headquarters in Oslo. We've added also some some acoustic elements uh, with reused uh, textiles, and I think these these stripes that you can see just here is um, are kind of blue, so they are reused uh, jeans actually. Um, bit about the rules and regulations. Um, we have quite strict building codes and, and uh, regulations and a very strict interpretation of, interpretation of the EU rules regarding uh, the construction products regulation or CE marking as it's called. Um, in terms of CE marking, not all materials need the, this uh, certificate. Some materials are not defined as construction projects and therefore do not need this accreditation, neither new or used. An example of this is moldings or upcycling of materials. For example, if you use windows as partition, partition walls. Um, Uh, on top of EU regulations, um, we have national building codes in Norway, which requires that building materials must have documentation, regardless of CE marking, whether they are new or old. It's more like a technical uh, specification document. Okay. Go on. When it came to application process with Oslo municipality, we entered the dialogue with them before sending in the application, which um, where we explained the project's aims and ambitions. And we had a clear concept for the building size and the volume of the extensions, but more specific details, such as window sizes and materials and colors and details were not clear at that point. And we didn't know what materials and components we are, uh, would find or with that, that would be available in the reuse market. The council were supportive. They showed flexibility and trusted us, which was nice. We agreed that uh, we would send updated facade drawings after all reuse materials had been sourced. Um, yeah. So what were the results? Um, this is taken from a report. A great report. It's made by my by um, Entra and Future Builds. Uh, that's um, Norwegian. Um, um, they made this report, and and I'll send you the link to download it. It's Norwegian, <laughs> unfortunately, but uh, I think it's possible to to find some information there anyway because it's full of figures and pictures and illustrations. Um, so by preserving the existing building and adding the new extension in reuse materials, it had an enormous environmental impact. A 70% reduction in CO2 emissions compared to a conventional building or a conventional rehabil rehabilitation. Of course, along with a huge amount of waste reduction. In other words, a completely new building uh, with the late, latest environmental standards would have a far greater negative impact on the climate. Oh yeah, so this is the report I was talking about. They made a full report with all documentation for all materials and building components. Um, yeah, you can check it out. I guess I'll, uh, I'll, I'll share with the link with you. Oh. So we are witnessing a revolution, we like to say, in the building industry. The fact that we could build an eight-story building with reused materials in the heart of Oslo, bound by some of the strictest building regulations in the world, I think proves that the concept of reuse on a large scale is not only realistic, but it's also feasible, and it can result in truly attractive projects. And this is a huge step towards achieving our climate goals. So this project, KA13, has changed the way we work and the way we design reuse experiences from KA13 in all other projects, of course. 
So at the end, I will like to share with you some of my reflections or advice on the way. <laughs> People have reused buildings and building materials for thousands of years. It's just that the late, um, the last 60 or 70 years, we seem to have forgotten how to do it. And historically, we used to build with few materials and with the best possible quality. Although this is also influenced, of course, by the fact that all the, all the not so good buildings from the past are demolished. <laughs> uh, but this way of building needs higher competence. Imagine building a great bridge and all you have is rocks. I think, or I hope, that we will somehow get back to these ways also for modern buildings. With transformation comes unpredictability. And I think we as architects and consultants need more responsibility for making new solutions and innovation. The future is not pre-accepted and innovation needs a certain freedom to take responsibility. An important experience is also that there is great differences and challenges uh, regarding the different building materials. Some are expensive, some are cheap, some are for sale in great amounts, some you have to search for. Some need a high degree of manual work, others almost nothing. And we also found out that um, people always uh, think that if you find reused building materials, these materials will be really old. But that's not true. People, um, buildings are uh, refurbished and, and changed all the time. And if you could establish a market for uh, reused building materials, you would find a lot of new materials. This building is, was erected in Oslo in 2009. Uh, it was changed just a few years ago, and we got the glass facade uh, used on the, on the ground floor from this building. Uh, all certificates, all documentation is right at hand. It's just uh, demounting it, moving it, remounting it. Find methods to convince the clients about reuse. Um, our experience is the, that the most, uh, the most effective way here is to find out how they can spend less or get more income. Um, if they sell instead of deposit, reuse instead of buying new material, and of course, not demolishing buildings. These pics are from another project. It's quite close to K13. <clears throat> it's another existing office building that the client wanted to demolish and replace. Uh, preferably as tall as possible, um, or maybe uh, the same height as the existing one. But as it dawned upon them that uh, the Oslo municipality would never allow such a tall building in this site, uh, now, um, in contrast to like 60 years ago, the fate of this building was uh, sealed. And so we did the re uh, reuse um, and refurbishment project also there. If you work with innovation, uh, you know that it requires taking on new roles, or as we say, new hats. <laughs> and I would encourage you to be brave. Uh, don't expect other people to do the job. Search for materials anywhere. Search for new business opportunities, new niches, new fields of work. And keep it on a practical level. Um, we work, uh, we who work with reuse now, we are a bit worried that people will start working with this in a very theoretical or digital level. Uh, <laughs> these stores were offered to us as uh, reused materials, but they were demounted without attention to the fact that the door consists of both a door and a frame, um, uh, which you need. Um, and you need to know these things. It's not that complicated, but you have to spread the word that this is important. 
and you have to keep it on a practical level, as I said. Um, we have to collaborate and, of course, also ask a lot of questions all the time. A circular building industry will require great competence and a new kind of commitment and collaboration, both between the designers and the engineers, but also with the contractors and craftsmen. It requires real craftsmanship, not assembly. This pile of construction material was demounted from KA13. And we were on the site together <clears throat> with the, with the um, workers. It came to a kind of spontaneous uh, brainstorming. What to do with this? And the contractor uh, suggested that we saw it into pieces and build a simple but beautiful wooden floor. And that's an idea you would never get from a database or just by scanning it or putting it into a computer. To work with this and all kinds of reused materials, you need hands and you need experience. And I like to think that in a circular economy, the wise hands will be just as important as artificial intelligence. New developments should be regenerative, built on the foundation of understanding uh, of what is already there and adding to the health and the sustainability and biodiversity of the context. We have more local resources than we think, and we should utilize these along with the local knowledge. And we need to focus on quality. Products with high quality will last longer and can of course be reused later. The best buildings are reused. And beautiful buildings are valued, conserved and adapted. And outliving their origin original function and beauty might be one of the most important criteria for a sustainable and circular building industry. We are working on our next <laughs> reuse projects. Um, I'm looking forward to continuing this. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please do ask. Thank you. Wow. Asli, that's so, so inspiring. It's, uh, it makes it feel like you make it seem so easy in a way that, oh, we could just do this again. And the, uh, you know, the city officials were just welcoming you to, you know, see how it goes. And I don't know, there, there must be magic there, I think. But, but um, there are many, many questions in the chat. And so hopefully we'll just, we'll get to them all. We'll get to as many as we, we possibly can, because everybody's so curious about how to do this. But in, before we get to the question, I'll just ask a question from, from us, which is really, I think is reflected actually in a, in a question in the chat, which is really how do you determine which of these reused materials are, are healthy? I mean, it, you, you said in the beginning of your talk that health in your materials, and I know from, from our conversations, is an important factor in the work that you're doing. Um, but how do you determine whether a reuse material, you know, it's great that it's reused, but then how do you determine that it's also healthier? Yeah, um, we got a lot of help um, from, um, from uh, for example, FutureBuilt, which is a Norwegian, um, uh, um, what's it called? Oh, it's an official um, uh, uh, <laughs> Pool of uh, engineers and people who, who know a lot about, about buildings and trying to, to move the borders um, and to make innovation in the building industry. And we had a lot of, of help from different um, consultants um, regarding CO2 emissions, but also energy and, uh, and um, the health of the materials and the, the emissions uh, inside the building. and everything. So we we collaborated with all these people. We, we don't know everything ourselves. But to say, just to, to go further into that question, so 
say that a building, like you said, the, the windows were ordered for one building and then they were the wrong size, so then you were able to use them. But suppose they were windows that were made of vinyl. Would you, at, at what point, like, how did you determine whether a material was, you know, was that in house or was that future built that was deter making those determinations? It was uh, our, our consultants, yeah. Because uh, we, uh, in the beginning, we just had a huge amount of um, possible uh, reuse materials and we were searching everywhere. <laughs> and we had these Excel files and, and it was just everywhere. Uh, nobody, we had high ambitions, but actually no plans. <laughs> and, um, but after a while uh, in the project uh, pro process, we found that the first thing we have to do when searching for getting possible material, we need to know if it's uh, if it fulfills the, the requirements. So that was the first uh, stop on the way. And healthy materials is is uh, part of that. Yeah. Thank you. There there are so many there's so many pieces of this puzzle that I think everybody's dying to figure out yeah. and so many great questions from everyone thank you all for your questions and for upvoting um we see the more popular uh, questions here so let's start with one from james um james asks did you source these materials during design or construction and where were these materials stored uh it was both um design and construction uh, this building process was actually a quite normal process because we had a tenant and a normal deadline um, and through the project we, we started out uh, the first thing we had to do was to convince the client that we, it was, this would be possible <laughs> and also the tenant and they went with us they agreed to do this and um, so we started and the sourcing materials was the process that continued all the way through to the to the end. And now I did sh share some uh, the, most of the reused materials, so some of them, but there are also new ones. I mean, I would think that it would be quite easy to reuse doors, for example, uh, but that wasn't very easy. Um, mm. There aren't that many doors available, and we didn't have time to to search for them. So that's most of the doors are new and the glass walls as well. Yeah. So it was some had some of the materials were successful, uh, successfully sourced as uh, reused materials, but also we had to face that uh, we had a deadline and we had uh, we had to uh, get this building finished to, to that. Yeah. Right. Speaking of so the deadlines and your sourcing, these 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 materials are coming in at, in in different time frames during the process, there's a question about the drawing sets. So we'd imagine, so I imagine it was not a traditional drawing set. So how did you create the drawing set for this? If it was, you had different kinds of materials coming in at different points of the design and the construction phase. Yeah, we, um, I'm not sure I understand, but I can answer the, the previous question about the storage. Because the client has a lot of buildings nearby. Um, um, some of them are empty, some of them are under uh, redevelopment, and so we used um, some storage space there. We also uh, rented some storage space in other buildings, and um, yeah, it was quite complicated because we had to keep track of uh, which materials were uh, were uh, hid where, <laughs> and um, and what kind of materials it was, and. You can ask again if I'm not sure if I understood the, the last question. Well, I think it was more about you know how how you end up with a traditional, well, you imagine a non-traditional drawing set. You know, the, your, your set of construction documents, um, if it had to change while you were already in the construction process. Yeah, yeah, we had to. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We <laughs> we draw the the. In the beginning, we were wondering about, uh, are we going to draw these drawings uh, with tolerances that are greater than normal? 
could we use dotted lines or could we say that this window has to be between somewhere? But um, we found out that we had we actually had to draw it in a quite traditional way, because if not, the amount of information would just be enormous. You could do it for a smaller project, but for this kind of size, you would have to um, make some some limits and some some norms or some guidelines to. And for example, for windows, we we made a window drawing as we normally do, and we got the, the results and. They were uh, absolutely not what we wanted or expected, <laughs> of course. <laughs> this will change when the market uh, grows, you know. But um, then we had to consider, could we use them anyway? Could we use them in different parts of the building? And we realized that in on the top floors of the building, the most important thing is sunscreen. And in the lower parts of the building, the most important thing is daylight coming through the windows. So we, we um, distinguished uh, between the different, I mean, we do this all, uh, all the time also elsewhere, but, but we had to consider if we could uh, accept some of the differences that um, were um, offered to us. Yeah. Great. Thanks. And Osil, there's another question which um, has a lot of votes, which is it's reuse always sounds like it's going to save a lot of money because the parts are the, you know, the parts are either tossed away or, you know, they're inexpensive because they're used, but it clearly takes a lot more of design time and construction time. And like you said, the wisdom of the, the crafts people to be able to work with the materials. And so can you talk a little bit about the cost? Well, the cost is very different from uh, between the different materials. Some are easy to find, and some are cheap, and some are, and some are extremely difficult or complicated to reuse, and and therefore also expensive. Um, but um, most of the added um, cost in this project is because of um, designing or the, all the consultants. Uh, the material, some of the materials were a lot more expensive, like the hollow core slabs. Those were extremely expensive. I think 11 times as expensive as, as uh, compared to normal. That's just a number I've heard. <laughs> but, uh, and it, it also complicates it that this project had a lot of um, challenges that has nothing to do with it being a reuse project. It was, uh, the ground um, was difficult and it was water in the basement and stuff like that. But um, after all, it's, uh, it's a uh, commercial, commercially valuable project for ENTA. And they say, okay, we didn't, uh, maybe we lost some, uh, income or it was a bit more expensive but what we have learned and what we have achieved in this process is much more uh, than the, the cost of the process so it's difficult to say uh, it differs a lot between the different materials and uh, but I think um, with some experience if you start by, by choosing the, the simple ones you will get some experience. And from there you can build more experience and more markets and more business. Yeah. So you think it will get less expensive as you as you continue this process? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there's a like you mentioned, there's there's a lot of business opportunity in this and that maybe if the supply chains for reused materials get easier, then maybe the whole system will become easier. There's another question that follows that one, which is um, the testing of materials to make sure that they comply, like those structural slabs that you showed. Um, it must have taken a long time to make sure that those reused materials also comply with with standards. So how easy was it to get your, you know, to get people, engineers or 
whomever that is working, other consultants that are working with you to, um, what this person, what Christopher says is to take ownership of other people's products and, mm. and you know, bring them into your contractor and your, um, your contractor's liability. So if the parts fail, who's, who's liable for that? This is a very, yeah. very good question, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's irrelevant. It's uh, also very relevant in, in Norway. Um, the answer is um, that, um, well, <laughs> if you want to test the material, building material, the normal thing to do is to uh, crush it, which is a problem <laughs> with reuse. Um, we did, it was very different also between different materials. With the steel, uh, you can make chemical tests and you can make some kind of calculated risk analysis about uh, does this, uh, this, the same amount of steel have almost or more or less the same quality. Uh, whereas the, the concrete um, slabs, uh, we drilled like um, probes of the material and they were crushed like they <laughs> normally do. But um, we got a lot of help, as I said, from from Future Build, which is a, a foundation, I think, in, in Norway. Uh, and um, uh, the answer to the liability question is, um, in most cases, Entra, the owner, had to take some risk, and they have to take the the risk and the liability after after all this uh, uh, all the different materials. But my my Dutch friend, um, he says uh, the the ultimate uh, test of a material is that it has been standing there for several years. So <laughs> yeah, well, it's a bit uh, that's a joke, but um, but it's uh, it's somewhat true as well. Um, and I just wanted to say another thing. Uh, yeah. A great question during the process was who's going to own the materials? That's a big issue. And this, we keep discussing it here in Norway between the government and the contractors and the, or the developers. Um, and in the beginning, it was a great question also in the process for us. Like, like if, you found, if we would find something great out on the market or just on the internet, would we go out and buy it? Could we buy it as architects or consultants? Should the contractors buy it? Should the, uh, the, cl the cl our client buy it? It was difficult. And most of the cases, the, the developer bought the products. Yeah, that's very important. You know, there's, a, there's um, just the question to that, to the point that the clients are taking risks by you know, they have to take some risk. So there's questions about like, then how do you find clients who are willing to take this risk? Or how do you convince a client to reuse materials in their project? How do you sell this idea? If the cost is higher, if they have to take a risk, you know, how do you find these clients? Oh, yeah, um, I think um, I have to, I would say that uh, you have to start with a, with a smaller, I would recommend that you start with a smaller project. Um, we don't get clients that want to reuse a whole of first labs as it is now. This was a pilot project and, and Entra uh, went uh, embarked upon it because it was a relatively small scale. It's 4,000 uh, square meters. And the footprint of the of the extension wasn't. Uh, I mean, it was um, it was doable, <laughs> but it wasn't an enormous risk about this project. And this was what they wanted to do. And the the amount of PR that they have got afterwards is just huge. So, so for them it was worth it. Um, but they we work with them now, but they won't do the construction part again yet. So I guess um, for for the time being, we have to uh, focus on the, um, on the possible materials and the, po the materials that have all certificates and everything is uh, um, okay. 
and it's there are a lot of them if you just search for them and um, and that there's no risk actually yeah um we have another question um by jill that asks what would accelerate the use of existing materials so you know both at the policy level or at the practical level and you can speak to it from from your locality of course um, I think it's the, the, the greater the market, because uh, that was the big um, uh, big issue. Uh, finding the, the materials was actually the, the most difficult part. Mm -hmm. And um, just earlier today, I, I talked to a lot, there's a network in Norway. Um, trying to deal with this and trying to um, boost the process. And there were two two guys. Uh, they had no PowerPoint. They were just sitting there and they were uh, had a um, company called uh, Mounting and Demounting and Remounting. And they, uh, I mean, I've been um, talking about getting the contractors in the process for, for many years now, but finally they were there. And they talked about reusing foundations. You could uh, and, and and to get them in in there and talk and just listen to their advice and their experience. I mean, they have machines on the site, and they uh, they ha they have also changed the mindset. So now they are keeping all the materials, um, and the clients or the com um, everyone has suddenly started keeping materials, which. Is which is great, and I think uh, I think this will go so fast. Next few years, if that answers the question. Yeah, no, I think yeah. that that's true, and that's just very, very encouraging. I mean, what you, the way that you speak about it really is inspiring to um, to get a lot of other folks to do it. And you know, a lot of these questions or comments in the chat are, where can I find reuse? pieces here in New York City or in other parts of the country. And I think, you know, every you know, you make a very convincing argument, especially that 70% reduction in, in embodied carbon is huge, huge, huge. And, you know, we know that the gutting of interior spaces is also off the charts. It's not measured quite as often, but just all of the pieces that go into make up the inside of the building as well are huge embodied carbon. So um, you're making a really great argument and the building is very beautiful as well. And you came up with new product lines in the midst of it. <laughs> it's just such a beautiful, beautiful project, Asli. Thank you so much for sharing it with us today. We have so many more questions, but we're at the top of the hour. And so we're gonna have to start to close it down, but we thank everybody for coming. And I think Christina has a little bit final conclusion here, but thank you so much for, for doing this today and thank you to the Norwegian consulate for introducing us um, and hopefully we'll we'll stay in touch and continue to watch your future projects. Yes, yes. Um, so sadly, this is our last event of the semester, uh, but please keep an eye out for our fall events. We always have things churning at the lab. First, if you are a student, graduate or undergraduate or no student working on design projects that are innovating with healthy materials, or addressing climate change, we have the annual student design contest of role models coming up. The submissions are due at the end of this month, May 23rd. You could win $1,000, get feedback from an amazing lineup of, of jury members and media attention. And of course, be a role model of healthy material innovation. And secondly, an important heads up that our podcast Trace Material is brewing up the third season. It'll be out this summer. So if you subscribe to our mailing list, you'll be notified when the first episode of season three, which is all about mycelium is gonna be out. Um, we'll have links on the chat for both of these things. Um, thank you again. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, the Norwegian Consulate, as John Sarah mentioned, Mad Architects and to all of you. And thank you, Seal, so much. We'll see everyone in the fall.